you know, we tend to put it into a yes or no, like zero or one. The deer are moving or they're not. Well, that's not true. They're always moving, but maybe it's some conditions like this, and especially the rut where it just tilts it a little bit more to where you go from only seeing no deer to one or two deer to the uh, movement rate being up where now I saw seven or eight deer. It just gave me a little bit more opportunity, and I conclude holistically that the deer were moving today. So collar temperature versus what we would say ambient temperature. The collar temperature is just what it was for that buck. So behaviorally, um, you're typically going to see the temperatures for the collar, if it's really cold, be less because he's situating himself to where it's not going to be as cold as the environment would be. So behaviorally, they can they can move around and, and moderate the temperature somewhat. So this one's a little bit more difficult. Notice the y-axis now is not um, just yards per hour, but it's change in yards per hour. And so now you're looking at a gradient of if we move from a collar temperature of about 20 degrees and we get it up to 80 degrees, over the time that we looked at that buck, do we see a positive change or a negative change. Negative change meaning they're moving less. And, and what we see right there very clearly from about 30 degrees, that's kind of our sweet spot in the south, is going to be about 30 degrees. If we move from 30 degrees up to probably about 50, we see that they are moving on average an increase relative to their baseline, recent baseline, when we have those temperatures. And then when we start moving up, when we have the really warm snap that we all despise, where it's, oh my God, it's 80 degrees, mm. we see a decrease. Oh, dude. <laughs> Andrew had a whole hunt get ruined because they Hey, listen, that. I went, we we camped, we did everything. We were going to, I mean, we were getting ready to go in there and stack them. And <laughs> we went in on, it was like that warm front in December. And I saw, I was in the woods I was camping. I was in the woods, dark to dark, every single day, backpacking, and I saw one deer mm. in like five days. In an area we typically see quite a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, a lot of bucks. And same time frame, we've killed a lot of bucks. And it was seventy five degrees. Yeah, and it's funny because I I like going back and forth on the whole temperature thing, and I'm like, the temperature has a lot to do with it. The temperature doesn't have anything to do with it. And then something like that happens. I'm like, the temperature is everything. <laughs> <laughs> the temperature is everything. So anyways, yeah, that happened. That was not fun. That kind of broke my spirit a little bit. I'm still recovering from it, but anyways. All so. right, so kind of a psychological analysis here. Oh, boy. <laughs> did, the, did the warm temperature affect your enthusiasm to hunt? Did you have, during that period of time, did you have less hours in the stand because of that? Normally, I would say absolutely. This time, no, because I was stuck out there. <laughs> you had no choice. So yeah, I was I was in the stand or slipping through the woods for the, from dark to dark every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, and the only deer I saw was on the first day of the hunt when it was still a little bit cold. It was right when the warm front rolled in. I saw a spike at like, I don't know, three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and that was it. We had deer walk through our camp in the middle of the night. So it's like, they're here. Cause at, at first there was also, there was uh, three of us hunting at the same time and we all three stayed in. So when you're looking at, you know, man hours, man days in the woods, we're, we're all in the woods from daylight to dark, three of us for that many days. Nobody saw, we saw between all three of us in that entire week, we saw three deer. Mm. And, we were like, maybe they're just not here. But then we would go out and there'd be a fresh rub the next morning somewhere. Yeah. Fresh scrape. All the scrapes are opened up. And then uh, coming out after dark or going in before daylight, we would run into deer. Or after it got dark and we're getting out of the trees, we hear them come out of the thicket and walk past us. Or they come walking through camp in the middle of the night. Like that happened every single night. So we're like, they're still in here. We're just not, they're just not moving during the day. And these are also... Uh, this is an area we've hunted multiple years in a row. We know where the good spots are. We've killed multiple bucks in there before, seen a lot of deer in there, and all these. So all the spots that we were hunting are proven spots on these exact dates as well. Uh, you know, the the week that we hunted it is when we've killed deer in there in the past. Uh, ruts going on, like there, we know that there's does and estrus. They're laying down the sign, and yeah, it was just a dud. <laughs> I mean, a dud. Yep. So we've all experienced it, but that is an interesting point though, about hunter effort, uh, because that is one thing 
that I mean, if it's warm outside, I'm a lot less likely. It affects me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. and it's it's not even just whether or not you go. It's also the amount of effort you put into doing things right. So, and this kind of also gets into the moon phase thing a little bit, where I, th- I think there's a little confirmation bias well, there because because we'll get to it. We'll get to it. But uh, you know, if you think that it is like a slam dunk, you got the moon on your side. You got the weather on your side. You know, it's the rut like this and that. You're going to probably get in earlier than, first of all, you're going to go. Second of all, you're probably going to get in earlier than you would have normally. You're probably going to try to be a lot more quiet. You're probably going to be a lot more um, careful about your wind and everything. And you're probably not going to be playing on your phone as much. You probably won't be on Instagram as much during the hunt. Hey, yeah. Hey, that's right. Jacob was watching TikToks full blast in the stand this year and killed a buck. <laughs> Side story, yeah. Yeah, yeah not, Side story. Did do that. But yeah, I, I just feel like your overall effort goes up. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so that's why it's a little bit hard to account just anecdotally what people say about it. There probably is something to it. Like with the weather, like we kind of know that cold weather uh, has always been better for deer hunting. But there's also the the side of it where you're just... Probably trying harder. You're crossing yeah. your T's and dotting your I's, at least. What, what's your opinion on that? Um, so what we know, unless, and you know, I get this comments a lot, you know, my deer are different. Maybe mm. your deer are different. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the data would be very, very clear <clears throat> that the deer were moving. Uh, maybe not as much. Maybe more tortuous. Maybe they didn't have the movement rate, but... They were on their feet. Maybe they were restricted to cover mm-hmm. and them not coming out as much. But um, to me, kind of what's being revealed here is that w- we can have a compromise with this in terms of what, what we have said in the past versus what I think is being revealed now is that deer are moving every day. They have to. All the stuff we said previously, they're moving. We have the documentation. But maybe... We just have a very sensitive little threshold to where, but if they move a little bit more, we have a lot more sightings. And because of that, we conclude, quote, the deer are moving. You know, we tend to put it into a yes or no, zero or one, the deer are moving or they're not. Well, that's not true. They're always moving, but maybe it's some conditions like this, and especially the rut where it just tilts it a little bit more to where you go from only seeing w- no deer to one or two deer to the uh, movement rate being up when I saw seven or eight deer. It just gave me a little bit more opportunity, and I conclude holistically that the deer were moving today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think I heard, uh, I guess it might have been one of your graduate student, Luke. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Luke Resop. Luke Resop, he was talking about it, and he put, he put it as uh, you're playing a very low odds game. And so it just, it doesn't take very much. And I've even heard Mariah talk about this too, where uh, he gave an example one time on a podcast where he was he was saying he he went out and it was a rut hunt and he didn't see anything and it was terrible. And then he came out and on the opposite like mountainside he saw four bucks chasing a doe and he's like, well, if I'd been sitting over there, this would have been the best hunt of my entire season. And but you didn't see that, and you know, so that that going to show that the like you touched on there the threshold for what is good versus bad isn't very high. Cause now that hunt I just mentioned that I just spent five minutes complaining about. <laughs> if I had went in there and I didn't see anything for two days and then I saw a target buck, I'd have been like, this is great. The real good hunt. Yeah, absolutely. But I did not. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> see anything. Skunked. Oh, I better yeah. leave it's all a squirrel. Yeah. And another thing on this slide, you've got humidity and wind speed, uh, correlated with change in yards per hour. So these are pretty interesting. What's your read on this? Yeah, the uh, so f- I guess first of all, notice we don't see a really big change in yards per hour. So if you want to look at what's driving the relationship and what might be going along for the ride, my conclusion is it's temperature. And when you have these big swings in temperature, going back to what the meteorologist recommended years ago, there's some stuff that comes along with it, is that we might have some changes in humidity and wind speed, et cetera. Uh, But when we isolate it, we see there's a little bit of a difference with humidity. Now we see a, when it gets to be really, really low humidity, so it's really, really dry, we can see a difference of up to about 30. 
So a decrease of about 30 yards per hour when we control for everything else, but just look at the humidity. And the biological interpretation, I'm not a upland game bird hunter and I don't have dogs, et cetera, et cetera. But you, you hear that consistently from our, our, our quail hunters and so forth. It's really, really dry. They can't scent as well. Mm-hmm. Have no idea if that's what's going on. But I think that's a reasonable interpretation. That's exactly where I was about to go to it. We interviewed a, a, a nationally renowned canine handler, Tom Brownlee, and we were talking about basically the science of scent and how scent works and moves across the landscape. And that's what he was saying. Mm-hmm. He said that uh, actually a day like yesterday, where it was really wet, we had rain that rolled through Alabama kind of early, and uh, it was kind of cold, overcast. That was a really good scenting day. So I took my dog out and we went bird hunting. Um, that, that's a, that's when it's easiest for them to smell. So that's why I was really curious about what you were going to say about the humidity. Because, yeah, when that humidity percentage dipped below 20, which is also a little bit weird for around here. That doesn't happen a ton. That's definitely an, an anomaly, I would right. say. Uh, right. That also seems to have decreased movement, which, again, makes sense. They can't get... Because, like, drawing it back to the, to the bird dog thing... Um, when, when I have like a really good breeze and really good scenting conditions, my dog hunts a lot better, meaning he ranges out further from me. Mm-hmm. So in the first spot we hunted yesterday, just as an example, a lot thicker cover, wasn't a whole lot of wind. He was not ranging very far. Got to the second spot, and as soon as we got out of the truck, you could just feel a draft coming up the swamp, like nice headwind. And I cut him loose, and he was gone. I mean, he went, he, he was ranging really good, hunting really hard. And, uh, that's just as an example, like that's what it does to my dog. I don't know if deer are the same way, but it is interesting to think about it when, especially when you get around the rut, those bucks, uh, it's just easier for them to smell things and their nose. It's kind of like in the cartoons, like Tom and Jerry, there's the pie on the windowsill and you know, the like steam comes off the pine. It's like, come here. That's, (laughs) I feel like that's what it's like for critters too. Like, you know, bucks, if there's, you know, some estrus in the wind, they're maybe a little bit more likely to search harder cover more ground. That's just my thought. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what you might think about that. Well, I I can't disagree. I I largely do agree that's probably going on. Um, But I guess I would also say on that extreme humidity, it's really, really dry. What we would call the effect size there is only a decrease of 30 yards per hour. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's interacting, maybe it's affecting it some, but that's not enough for me to go, today's going to be a poor day or a good day just because of that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we haven't even gotten to the moon stuff yet, but I feel like with all this data, there's a lot of that, whether it's weather, moon phase, it's a lot of, yeah, like it's a, there's a difference, but if there is a difference, it's really slight. And uh, do you think that just boils down to that the deer just live out there? 24-7, 24-7, they have to breed, they have to eat, they have to drink, they have to sleep. Like, they're going to they're gonna do what they have to do regardless of what the conditions are, right? A hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and all we're seeing here are these relatively minor deviations from, from normal. Mm-hmm. You know, we're seeing the main movement bouts are around sunup and around sunset. We see a general increase during the rut. I mean, those are things that are repeatable. We can count on. We can plan our hunts based on it. And then the weather stuff is just a little bit, you know, extra. Icing on top. Little, potentially a little bit of, of icing. And, and people can, can look at the data and decide for themselves. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they may look at, at, at what we're presenting here and say, that is just not compelling enough. We just think that, we have seen enough now to where we conclude that there's a little something there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I can totally see people, myself included, nerding out about this where it's like, okay, today we've got, it's warmer than average. It's it's a really low humidity uh, and the wind speed is this. They ain't going to do nothing today. I'm just going to, I don't know, go fishing or something. I'm going to watch football or yeah. fish. Or, yeah. yeah. Um, what were you about to say? Wind speed. Wind speed. So this is something that gets brought up a ton from listeners, viewers of the podcast, and every now and with guests that a lot of people, there's some people that we've interviewed that actually like for mature buck movement, they seem to have success in higher wind speeds conditions, like that 15 plus 20 mile an hour plus winds. 
a lot of people despise hunting in those conditions. I think partially is due to their equipment. If it's windy and cold, they don't have good windproof gear. It's like miserable and they just don't want to sit in the stand very long. Hunter effort goes down. But also you hear people talk about pretty often we get messages that like, I just don't see a lot of deer in high wind conditions. Again, I say high wind, probably 20 plus mile an hour winds. Based off the data, and I know we have that's part of this chart right here, it doesn't seem like it really matters. And actually, it seems like there's a slight uptick with higher wind movement. Mm-hmm. Is that pretty much across the board, which I'll saw in a lot of the data? Yeah, that that was one of those variables where, uh, and believe it or not, in a, a the prior study from Oklahoma, that was one of the few things that we found was, but it was extreme. I mean, it was, you know, 20 plus, 30 plus, it was these really extreme winds, which there are very few of those events, but we did see like an uptick relative to that. But it's a different environment. Um, they may have a different cue they're responding on. Who knows? Yeah. It's just when you when you try to build a story around a rare event, it's it's difficult um, because you only have a few instances of that happening. There could have been other stuff going on. So again, it's not a consistent signal, not as reliable. So what we're seeing here with our data is that essentially there's not much going on. We see just a little bit uh, around no wind, and we see a little bit of an increase when it's above 20 miles per hour. But again, we're talking about a change of at the most 10 to 12 yards per hour. Not not that big of a difference. Yeah. So with that data, do you have any thoughts on hunting in higher wind conditions or, I mean, have you had any success hunting in higher wind conditions or anything like that? Because personally, I don't think I have, I went back and thought about it, but we do have some people that have that success. I mean, what is your thoughts on that from a hunter standpoint? Like, would you just not go to the woods if you had 20 plus mile an hour winds? I would probably be a wimp. <laughs> I mean, it would probably depend, am I in a climbing stand in a tree where I just may not feel safe at all, you know, being moved around by the wind. But if maybe if I was going into a, a box or something, I might. Uh, great question. I really, really don't have an answer. I, I have not had enough, I guess, very positive or very negative experiences where I can just say it was because of the wind. 